There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am outside. I'm in a shady spot. The sun is out, but I'm in the shade and it's cool, which I love because it's not going to stay that long. So I am in my element and I have my can of cold coffee from the vending machine. It's now the season where there's no more hot coffee available out of the vending machines, but it's a good morning. I'm in a great mood. I've had an interesting reading week, mostly great, and I have lots to tell you. One bail to tell you, but it was later the same day last Friday that I bailed on this collection of Australian short stories by Elizabeth Harrower. A few days in the country and other stories. I uh, read a few stories and uh, maybe three, I can't remember, three or four, and each one left me kind of vaguely dissatisfied and I just thought, you know, life is too short. As apparently she's this amazing writer that I had never heard of until, I mean, when I bought the book, I hadn't heard of her. Maybe her name, heard her name? Didn't know she was Australian, and then a few weeks later she died, and everybody on bookish Twitter was um, in tears about it. I have yet to see what the fuss is about. I assume, if my tastes are broadly generalizable, that it isn't about these short stories anyway. And I have finished four. Let's start with the best. I finished The Yield by Tara June Winch. This was a buddy read with Greg of Supposedly Fun for Aussie April, and... I finished it the day before yesterday. I'm still chewing on it, but I absolutely loved it. I won't be shocked if it's my book of the year. It's certainly going to be a strong contender. It broke my heart. It was beautifully written. It was such an important... It's the most literarily powerful work of Indigenous fiction I've ever read, and so much of it I could relate to, or I could extrapolate into the the injustices we have perpetrated upon the indigenous peoples of Canada. This book, and oh my god, I didn't purposely choose it to go with my blouse, but I kind of lucked out. I don't know. It's one of those books that hit me emotionally, but I do have things to say aesthetically or kind of critically. It's one of those books where I thought as I was coming to the end of it that I might just start again because there was so much and I know I didn't take it all in. I'll link to Jacqueline of Six Minutes for me's review because it's what piqued my interest and I should go back and watch that again now, but uh, certainly would echo her superlative reaction to this book. What a fine, important, justice-seeking novel. This is what fiction is for! And I also finished the uh, second volume of the Country Girls trilogy by Edna O'Brien. The Lonely Girl is the title in my edition. It has an other title. I don't remember what in other editions. But uh, this is a buddy read with Sonia of An Enthusiastic Reader, and we both absolutely loved it. I mean, Edna O'Brien, I don't think her recent stuff is very interesting to me, but uh, her Irish stuff is... She's such a Sean writer. So we met Kate or Kathleen in Volume 1 in her hometown and she escaped to Dublin at the end of Volume 1 and so this, with some dipsy doodles along the way, uh, carried through her story with her best frenemy, Baba, in Dublin and, and uh, a relationship that she gets into. So um, it was a beautiful, tender portrait of, of a person, in this case a young woman, but I certainly related to it as a gay man, who knew herself so little and had so little self-confidence, self-esteem, that she just clung to this older man in a way that was cringe-making, and Edna O'Brien did that so beautifully. I think this is an autobiographical trilogy. And they, the two friends, Kate and Baba, uh, escaped to London, and that's how Volume 2 ends. So uh, we are continuing right on to Volume 3. I'll talk about that in a minute, but just... Um, literary, uh, humane, well-drawn, quirky characters with quirky, an, an eye for the quirkiest, most revealing detail about the characters and about the, the setting. Uh, Edna O'Brien, people. I'm gushing. I will move on. So those were the two that were extremely positive. So because of those two books that I finished this week, I had such a stimulating, satisfying reading week. The other two were a bit of a mixed bag, but what united them was both of them 
were so beautifully written. I would say one proviso. I'll start with Una by Alice Lyons, which I read for the Irish Readathon. And this was a strong recommendation from Ronan Hessian and Hovery Madaban. And they are both writers. And I think this is a writer's writer, Alice Lyons. So I didn't enjoy it nearly as much as they did. There were some things I loved about it. So let me, I'm going to kind of wade, get in down in the weeds here. It is autofiction, I guess, or memoir. I, I saw references to it as autofiction. And this is the kind of autofiction that doesn't really work for me. It was kind of all over the place. And there was a lot of things that were not so interesting to me in it. And the thing that uh, I had the biggest trouble with was the premise or the, the assignment she gave herself that this uh, novel is a lipogram or lipogram, which is a type of constrained writing where a writer purposely denies themselves the use of one or more, I guess, letters of the alphabet, a particular letter or a group of letters. So Alice Lyons' thing was no O's. The title is Una. The main character is Una. And so there's all kinds of reasons why O doesn't show up in the text. And I guess it's called a pangrammatic lipogram or lipogram, which uses every letter of the alphabet except one. In many cases, it made the text stronger in some ways and made it fundamentally a weak reading, a, a, a bad reading experience for me and others. It forces the writer to squeeze fresh language out of her soul. And boy, there is a lot of fresh language in this book that was just glorious to read. But the downside for me as the reader was that I couldn't, for long stretches of this book, which I, admittedly I read over a long period of time, six or eight weeks, just dipping into it here and there, but I had trouble immersing myself in the story, in the writing, because I was paying so much attention to the missing O. And that kept pulling me out. There were places where I was able to just move deeper than that and forget about it and get into it. But then the flaw was that there was also some really awful writing in here because she couldn't use the letter O. So I, I want to give you an example of both because I think if you're a writer, maybe you would like it. I just thought it's contrived, that thing, lipogram. I will never try another one of those. But what the hell do I know? Alice Lyons uh, becomes an artist. So she grows up in New Jersey. Uh, mother dies young, and w that's a wounding experience that is a big part of the story here. I believe it was her mother, maybe her father. I think it was her mother's people were in Ireland. So she ends up as a young woman emigrating to Ireland and making a life for herself there as an artist and living in a small town. I have so much to say about it. I'm going to try to keep it shorter. I could do a full review, but I don't want to put... Uh, of media negative review for this book because I think a lot of people would love it. It's the writing about art and the art making process that just was gorgeous. If I was doing a full review I would read this whole passage but I won't take that time to read it even though it's short. I'll read the first three paragraphs of chapter 38 which is about Sienese pigments. So she's writing about color, and you can see the cover. I think this might be the pigment that is shown on the cover. I'm not sure, but anyway, just listen to this. And don't fuss about the missing O's, because it's just, it's gorgeous. It's poetic. Sienese pigments in jars, pestled very fine. Sienese pigments in five jars, carried with me all these years since that first Italian trip. Venetian red, burnt umber, raw sienna. Yellow earth and terre verte. When rubbed between fingers, the hue spreads and sticks in the fingerprint grain, making a beautiful pattern. Pigments need fineness. Like talc, like dust, pigments are at the edge between material. Uh, this always happens when I come to this place. Like talc, like dust, pigments are at the edge between material and air. With a breath puff, they'd be missed. With water, they make a paste, which is usual, but pigment mist, as an idea, is interesting as well. Red earth, it hasn't a scent. In fact, it subtracts smells. If there were a stench that needed riddance, this is the stuff. It is pestled earth that applies balm in what reeks. 
But there are things in this life that are anti-scent, draw up what isn't nice, yet, main yet maintain the same mass, are unswelled by what they retain. Venetian red pigment achieves this miracle. Venetian red pigment emits a muffled thrum, palpitates in the jar. When appearing in large passages in painted surfaces, it signals a steady, barely perceptible, yet persistent heartbeat. Pacemaker's timings can be interfered with by this dye stuff. Okay, um, I don't know if the first three paragraphs gives you the full effect of what the, the, the entire chapter does, but it, to me that was uh, one of the more breathtaking pieces of writing about art and color in the book. So there is just pages and pages probably way more than half, like 60, 70 percent of the book has just gorgeous prose. But there are also clunkers where, because she can't use O, and it's just like, why are you doing this silly project if you're coming up with these kinds of sentences? So just at random. What will happen me? She couldn't use the word too, so what will happen me? Um... Uh, that term, the IRA, was a distant thing that had zilch meaning in urban farms. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's not so bad. Um, there were others that were more egregious than those, but that's enough to get the gist. And if that kind of thing doesn't bother you, it just kept pulling me out of what, for much of this, was a really powerful piece of writing. Um, I didn't love the autofiction that was a little bit um, shapeless for my tastes, but what I connected with was her discovering herself as an artist, discovering her tools, discovering her medium, and I'm not somebody that knows anything about art. Whenever she'd write about an artist, I would Google that artist, and I loved all of that. And making a new home for herself as a single person in a small village in Ireland and um, getting to know her neighbors and all of that, uh, maybe a little less successful, but still quite compelling. I gave it three stars, and I kind of recommend it to that degree. But others of you that may not have the problem I had with the lipogrammatic thing might love it. And yesterday I finished this British novel, The Mating Habits of Stags, by Ray Robinson. It's published in 2019, and I bought it, I blame it on one of Eric Carl Anderson's book hauls. And I'm really glad I read it. Ultimately, I didn't like it. It's three stars. So I liked it to that degree. It wasn't successful for me, despite... Gorgeous writing. I love the writing in here so much. I would try something else that he's written. But this is a story about an unhappy old man who commits a crime, and it's a crime of vengeance. And I just think vengeance is stupid and uninteresting to read a whole book about. But if the story had just been about that, I think it still would have been a four-star read because just vivid, gobsmackingly beautiful writing with a whole bunch of North Yorkshire and regional English words and phrases and idioms that I had a field day tracking down. But he's a widower and his wife is recently deceased and that plays a big important part in the story and his grief. But he kind of takes up with a, another lady in a way that's mostly just friendship. And so she comes into the story, I guess, in the second third of the novel and then she takes over the novel and I didn't ever really warm to her and wondered what the hell she was doing taking up so much space, especially she was nice, but I didn't ever feel that she jumped off the page. But she crowded out anything that could have taken the vengeance story with the man deeper. And, and then we get all this, I have to say it, shit about her shitty family. She's got the worst daughter, adult daughter, drug addict, selfish, and grandchild and they take advantage of this grandmother character and I hated them and I think I was meant to but it just like uh, why why is this in this novel like I, I don't care it doesn't really relate to the story about the grieving widower man who committed the crime of vengeance it's so tertiary and it just by the end because of stuff that happens in the plot the man is off stage and then uh, I'm just immersed in all this like, it's stuff that you would see on 1980s and 1990s, like, Oprah-type TV shows. Just, like, white trash crap. And I just, ah, ugh, ugh. I mean, yeah, working class fiction, great. I don't want to be a classist, but these were just horrible people. And I don't mean the, the older lady, Sheila. She was nice, but not 
as vividly well drawn as the as the main character and i just think it didn't work for me gorgeous writing i assumed he was an old geezer too but he's not he's well he's maybe my age or younger or maybe is that an old geezer but i assumed he would be much older but he's young and he's been a, i think a musician and this is his third or fourth novel i i would try something else by him apparently from what mark nash says the, the other at least one of his other novels is completely different from this but this didn't i mean the nature writing if you're looking for something to read for springathon i mean the nature writing alone is is worth the price of admission here but the story didn't work for me by which i mean i gave it three stars i i really gave a lot of weight to the gorgeous writing but i hated the story by the end so that's what i finished so it's been pretty good and i'm feeling you know okay so maybe now is time for me to fess up you've probably all waiting been waiting for this <laughs> i had a confession to make so let me uh, do the math here so you know that my new year's resolution for 2021 as a reader was to limit myself to six books concurrently because uh, my reading was so out of control i was reading a dozen or more books for most of 2020 and books kept falling off the edges and i thought you know i like being a book slut and reading several books at the same time i do love that that's one of the best things about my reading life but i i have a, an addictive obsessive personality and so i always end up biting off more than i can chew so i did the six book rule with some exceptions like weekly buddy reads of short story collections where i'm just reading one short story a week don't count in that total and audiobooks don't count because they don't take time away from you know but those exceptions aside six books so i did that for two three months and i hated it because i, I need more i need i don't want to read six books a lot of the books that i'm reading um, are books that i want to dip into on a much less frequent level uh, uh, that i don't want to pick up every other day or if certainly every day they're books that i want to really think about them for like four or five days before i pick it up again and so i abandoned the six book rule and threw caution to the wind and stopped even checking how many books i was reading and surprise surprise it got out of hand again. So I was being coy and shy and demure about how out of control it got and have been teasing you all. So here is the th good. As of two weeks ago, I finally had a peek at the Goodreads currently reading folder and looked at the number. And at that time, two weeks ago, I was reading 30 books. And that did include five or six of the, you know, weekly check-in buddy reads that don't really count, but 30 books. It's like, oh my God, Sean, you can't do this. So that's when I said last week on my Friday Reads that I was in a bit of a book hole. That was the hole. Now, by last week, it was down to about 25. And by this week now, I've just looked and it's down to 17. 17, including four or five Buddy Reads that I don't count. So 12. So that is my sweet spot. Around 10 or 12 books is great. So... Uh, that was it. Uh, uh, I think getting up to 30 books for a few weeks every now and again is not going to be the end of me. None of these books fell off the edges. I certainly did become a little more ruthless, if that's possible, about bailing on stuff that wasn't working for me to chip away at it. But I have made a concerted effort to finish up stuff. And I wanted to finish up more for today, but it doesn't matter. I, I will finish up more for next week and uh, carry on so uh, i'm not going to always tell you how many and it's probably going to get out of control again very soon because may is here with its ambitious tbr but that was the thing <sighs> moderation is not my strong suit boys and girls so <laughs> uh, all right so i have started one book on audio and that is the last book for Aussie April. This is the last day of April, but I started it a week ago, and it's on audio. A Treacherous Country by K.M. Cromink. I think I had the pronunciation wrong. According to the audio narrator, who is not the author, but I assume that the pronunciation of the author's name on the, at the beginning of the audiobook is right. K.M. Cromink. A Treacherous Country. A historical novel set maybe 19th century. This British guy, he has a fiancé or a girl he wants to marry back in England, and her aunt has sent him over to, uh, to Van Diemen's Land, which is now Tasmania, in the 19th century to track down 
a niece of hers on the other side of her family. So no relation to this dude's fiance or whatever she is. And so he's doing it for brownie points because then he'll probably be allowed to marry this woman, this young woman. So he's there, he's a bumbling idiot. Um, he doesn't know anything about Van Diemen's Land slash Tasmania and it's dangerous and he meets all kinds of crazy characters and that's how the story's unfolding. The first character he meets is a cannibal, I think Irish cannibal, and he buys a horse I think from him and the horse is not very good. It's not just comedic but it is very funny. The audiobook is wonderful, narrated by Cam Ralph. And I'm having a good time with it. I'm 40% of the way through that, so I will finish it probably in the, in the next week. That was a recommendation from James, whose blog is Caustic Cover Critic, who I had on my channel just before Aussie April to recommend books, and this is one that he recommended. Very much enjoying that one. So tomorrow is May 1st, and I am so excited, and I'm so glad I finished enough that I've got my reading down to a dozen books, uh, roughly not including weekly check-in buddy reads. So here are things I'm starting in the first week of May. Before I forget, I'm going to be starting the third uh, volume in the Country Girls Trilogy by Edna O'Brien. It's a buddy read with Sonia of An Enthusiastic Reader. It's only 12 chapters long, so we'll finish it up in a couple weeks. And in this edition, the third volume is called Girls in Their Married Bliss. It may have other titles in other editions. Looking forward to that. May is Springathon at the first two weeks and the Asian Readathon. I will not be doing separate TBRs because I'm not doing much for those because I'm privileging another new Readathon, which you'll hear about in a minute, and have probably already seen my TBR for the 1900 to 1950 Readathon. So, one of the books I'm doing for the Asian Readathon is a buddy read, my very first buddy read with Roz of Scally Dandling about the books. And this is the Korean novel. The Korean novel, Trees on a Slope, by Wong Soon Won. I have done quite a bit of research on the pronunciation, and that's what I found. Wong Soon Won. There are a couple different spellings of Soon Won. I'll put all three of them in my show notes. I read and reviewed a collection of his short stories that I absolutely loved. He was known as South Korea's preeminent writer in the 20th century. And for good reason, I love those short stories. I'll put a link to that review. And this is a novel that was like the collection of short stories and like most shapely literary fiction coming out of Korea. It was translated by the UBC translating duo, Bruce and Juchan Fulton. He died uh, aged about 85, maybe, in the year 2000. It's said to be his most accomplished novel. So that sounds fabulous to me. One of the countries for Invisible Cities in May is Madagascar, and I think there's only one choice, maybe, to read, and that is a novel by a... Oh, goodness, what's the demonym for Madagascar? Madagascarian? Oh, Malagasy, but how do you pronounce it? Did you know the demonym? Demonym is what's the name for a person from, in either, in either or both adjective and noun form. Canada Canadian Madagascar Malagasy which is also the language and the people doing a little public service here for all you invisible cities readers Malagasy 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 so this is by a Malagasy Canadian writer Naivo beyond the rice fields and I don't I didn't find anything else but I had this book on my shelf I've had it for like three four years and I'm finally going to get to it. It's the first novel ever to be translated into English from Malagasy. The Malagasy language is called Malagasy, and it's the first novel ever to be... And uh, I'm glad Naivo goes by a... His pen name is Naivo because his... I'll try to pronounce his full name. Naivo Harasoa Patrick Rama Mongisoa. And he lives in Ottawa, and he's a journalist in Ottawa, which is in Canada, if you didn't know. And this is about the upheavals of Madagascar's past as it confronted Christianity and modernity through the twin narratives of a slave and his master's daughter. Well, that sounds pretty darn interesting. Published in 2017, and I think I've had it that long. Translated from the French. Okay, so it's not written in Malagasy. I, I said that in error. It was written in French, translated from the French by Alison M. Charret, or Charette. It's chunky. I will be getting started in the coming days. 
I have a non-fiction pick for Springathon, but I'm not going to start it this week. I'm going to start the novel that I've chosen, which has a kind of nature theme. It's a historical novel from Ireland that was passionately recommended to me by the no Irish novelist Covery Madavan, and that is A Quiet Tide by Marianne Lee. And this is about the real-life Irish female botanist, Ireland's first female botanist, Ellen Hutchins, who died aged 29 in 1815 and never got credit for her discoveries. And this is a historical novel based on her life. And that sounds fascinating. And I will let you know how it starts out next week. And most of the rest of what I'm going to be starting, because I'm not done yet, people, not even close, is for the 1900 to 1950 readathon. Once I found out about it, this is a readathon created, sponsored by Katie of Books and Things, and w it's the kind of readathon that, if I do it, will anyone notice that I'm doing it, because that's what I read. But I want to do a deep dive on some books that I've had sitting around and haven't, that don't typically fit into other readathons or whatever, so they're books that I've been dying to get to, and I'm going to get to them in May for the 1900 to 1950 readathon. So here is what I'm starting this week. This is a book that's been on my shelf since before I came to Booktube, Sleeping Waters by John Trevina. I talked about it at length and why I got it and everything in the TBR for this readathon. Sleeping Waters by John Trevino. It's a pen name for Ernest Henham, who died in 1946. And this was his first kind of realistic literary novel. He wrote a lot of melodramatic popular novels when he was a younger man. And this one is more serene and literary, which suits me just fine published in 1915. It's chunky, so I want to get started, and maybe it's no good, but I will be the arbiter of that. And the German novel that I got for Mel and Britta's Read More German Books 2020 Reading Challenge, but didn't get to, Alfred Doblin's Berlin Alexanderplatz, translated from the German by Michael Hoffman. And it's also chunky, supposed to be an amazing novel, it's certainly got an amazing cover. It's the great novel of Berlin and the doomed Weimar Republic. Do you see why I'm so excited? And I, I think I'll finish the Australian audiobook, so I will then start the Wizard of Oz novel, 1900, on audio, because I can get it on Apple Books for $3 or less. And finally, this is where those of you that are, you know, severely anti-monarchist can fast forward or turn the thing off, I am going to do yet another royal biography, and this is a buddy read with my fellow royal family enthusiast, the translator, Tina Cover, our very first buddy read, the new uh, biography of Elizabeth and Margaret, The Intimate World of the Windsor Sisters by Andrew Morton. I've never read, oh, I don't want to cover up Margaret's fabulous face. I've never read anything by Andrew Martin. I always was a little thought he was kind of just a gossip monger, but maybe not. My mom's reading this. She's loving it. Tina and I are going to have a good time. We're not doing like weekly check-ins or anything. She's too busy and that suits me just fine. We're just going to chat on Zoom. I don't know if it's going to be a chat that we'll release publicly or not, but we're going to chat on Zoom when we're both finished at the end of the month. So what a fabulous uh, reading week I have coming up, hey? That's what this particular empress is up to reading-wise. Uh, how about you princesses? Thanks for watching. Thank you.